Today we are in John chapter 2, reading the first 11 verses. And in these verses, we are going to witness and experience and hear the story of Jesus' first miracle. And, and the occasion is a wedding. It's a Middle Eastern wedding, and, and I say that because Middle Eastern weddings were, are much, much different than the weddings we experience here in America. Uh, some of those weddings, uh, not the ceremony itself, but we'll call it the after party, the wedding party would go on for two, three days, many as long as a week. And this was, uh, what was different is in weddings here, it's all about the bride, right? I, whenever I marry a couple, I always tell the groom, whatever your wedding day is, it is not about you. It is not about you. It's always about the bride, right? And, and, and that's okay. There's, you know, nothing terribly wrong with that. Um, but in Middle Eastern, in the, in the weddings in Jesus day, it was about the groom. The groom was the one that, that, through the wedding party. Often it was at the groom's house. And so everything was about honor and shame. Everything that happened either brought honor or shame to that groom. And so we've got this wedding that we're going to be going to today. And at this wedding is not only the bride and groom, but there are all of their relatives on both sides of the family that have come together for the celebration. And this is the the setting that John is going to be sharing with us today in these verses. And so as we read these verses, as we listen to these verses, you know, let's try to hear this wedding wine story with new ears, because maybe you've heard it before. But also, after we've done that, we're going to briefly consider what it means for our lives today. What does this miracle of Jesus turning water into wine mean for us? So I'll be reading John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation for us today. The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. Sounds like a decent thing to say, right? And he says, dear woman, that's not our problem. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Mom knows best, right? Mom knows best. So standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing, and each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus told the servants, Fill the jars with water. And when the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. And when the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing that it had come where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the, the best wine first, he says. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. May God add a blessing to not only our reading, but our hearing and our understanding of his word today. Oops, I want to stay right there for a minute. So we have this story. Some of you have probably heard this before. And, and I want to say right now, before I get into the message a little deeper, we hear this story and, and we, can, we can get sidetracked. We can get hung up. We can get busy going down rabbit trails like, whose wedding was it? Was it, was it Jesus' brother that got married or maybe his sister? Whose wedding was it? And, and um, you know, what's up with Jesus kind of, you know, not talking so nice to his mom? I mean, he should have treated his mom better, right? And, and on and on, we've got these questions and we get sidetracked. And what I want to tell you today is, well, all of that's fun. And boy, I and I... We do that sometimes on Tuesday mornings with the men group. Usually it's my fault because I like to get us going down a rabbit trail sometimes. But 
Today, I want us to focus on the miracle. And we're really going to just look briefly here at why is this miracle in the Bible? So hopefully you still have your Bible open there. If not, I'm putting the words on the screen. I want us to look at verses 7 and 8 because really... The verse, the, you know, the six verses leading up and, and the few verses after are, I'll say they, they add to the story, but here is the miracle. And so when you look, the very first thing I want to point out is when you look at this, notice the simplicity of this miracle. Notice just how easily and how quietly and the respect in which it was all done. Jesus simply says, Fill the jars with water. He simply says that to the servants. Fill the jars with water. And those servants go and get the water. I don't know. They had to go to the well to get the water. We don't know exactly where they had to go. But they go and get this water and they bring enough water to fill these six jars to the brim with water, which roughly translates to 120 to 180 gallons of water. Hold that number in your head. We'll come back to that in a minute. 120 to 180 gallons of plain old water. Plain old water. But notice, what does Jesus say next? Now dip some out. There was no prayer. He didn't even say the Lord's Prayer. He didn't give a word of command like, wine, come out, you know, kind of like he's going to do with Lazarus in a few weeks. Lazarus, come out. There was no pleading and shouting. You know, you know how sometimes pastors do. You know, the more intense we want the prayer to be, the louder we pray and the more we wave our hands, right? There's none of that. As a matter of fact, there was no laying on of hands. He didn't even go over and, and touch those water jars. There was no binding up of Satan. Okay, Satan, obviously it's your fault that we're running out of wine. It's not my disciples' fault that they came. There was none of that. There was no hocus pocus. There's no puff of smoke. Nothing. Jesus didn't touch the water. Matter of fact, Jesus didn't even ask to taste it first afterwards to make sure that his miracle actually happened, right? He simply says, fill the jars with water. Now dip some out. And then now take it to the master of ceremonies. The master of ceremonies was the guy that kind of ran the show, okay? Uh, he was usually a friend or hired by the, the groom to make sure that everything was taken care of at the wedding so that there, was, there would be no shame brought upon the groom or the groom's family. But what had happened here? They'd run out of wine. We don't know how many hours or days they had come into this, but Jesus simply says, Fill the jars with water, dip some out, and take it to the master of ceremonies. And the servants did that. And as we heard, it was the best wine ever, right? Well, so what did I tell you? 120 to 180 gallons, right? So I did a little math. Um, Typical bottle of wine these days is 750 milliliters. I'm sorry, I'm old school. I had to convert all that to ounces and uh, kind of do a little math. And you know what? Jesus' miracle then in our world today would have created, get this, somewhere between 614 to 921 bottles of the best wine ever. Now, we don't know how many people were at the wedding, and we're not going to go there because it doesn't really matter, but that's a lot of wine, right? That's a lot of wine. Don't worry, we'll get to that a little later yet. And yet, what I want us to notice, though, is that this wedding wine happened within the limits of a natural process. What I mean by that is Jesus didn't create milk out of this water. He didn't turn that water into, you know, coffee or Coke. What happened was... In, with that water, turning water into wine is, in essence, something that happens in nature. And what I mean is, every year, God has set up in the nature of the world this natural process by which water turns into wine through a process of rain and soil and sunlight and grapes, okay? But that wine doesn't happen like this. It takes time. It takes years to grow 
grapevines. I know nothing about it, but it takes a long time to grow grapevines. You've got to have the right amount of water, the right amount of sunlight, the perfect the perfect temperature. And, um, and then there's the whole process. Once those grapes are grown, uh, there's the process of gathering and crushing. I realized that right here would have been the perfect time to have a video clip from I Love Lucy. I thought of that this morning at Wayland and I didn't, I'm sorry, I'll have, I'll, maybe I'll bring it next week, but you know what I'm talking about? If you haven't seen it, look it up on YouTube. It's hilarious. But, but my whole point to this is in the natural process, turning water into wine takes time. It's, it's an involved process and, and it not only involves nature, but it also involves the activity of people, you know, doing the gathering and the processing. And then there's the fermentation. So winemaking is something that takes time and takes waiting. But yet, we just heard this story about this wedding wine at the wedding in Cana that, that Jesus simply took water in some jars, some clay jars, and he skipped that whole process, and he turned that water into wine. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Miracles, and, and in that book, here's what he says. He says, this miracle of Jesus is a kind of short-circuiting of a natural process a doing instantly of something which in general takes a longer period of time. Friends, in a, in a few weeks, we're going to come to another passage in the book of John, and we're going to be looking at several other of Jesus' miracles. And we'll probably come back to the same premise because Jesus does exactly there also. He does something instantly that in general takes a longer period of time to heal if healing can come at all or growth can come at all. So in this story today, this story of the wedding wine, this is something else I want you to think about. Jesus takes water. Water is inorganic. It's, it's non-living. It's, it's a fairly commonplace thing. Uh, more commonplace in our world today than perhaps in Jesus' day. But water was a common substance. And again, without a word, without a gesture, that water became wine. And again, we don't know exactly where. Did it become wine the moment they dipped it out? Was it already wine before they dipped it? Did it become wine when they began to pour it like we see here in this? Does not matter. Think about that, but put that aside here in just a minute with me. But he takes this inorganic, non-living, commonplace substance, water, and he turns it into an organic liquid. He turns it into something that can only be made by a process of fermentation. He turned it into something that belongs to the realm of life. In other words, he took something, water, that is completely dead. And in Jesus' day, it became something alive and living because of the way that wine was created then. So... Jesus, in this miracle, doesn't simply point out to those that knew who he was, his disciples, that, hey, I can do cool things with me. But what he was demonstrating for his disciples is, or what he was revealing, if you will, was his divine ability to not just be able to create a miracle, but to control the very process of nature. Jesus wasn't simply revealing that he had the ability to make miracles happen. He wasn't revealing himself to be the Christ, the Messiah. He was truly revealing himself to be the Son of God, God in human form. And then, if you still got your Bible there, um, I'm not going to put this on the screen, but at the very end of today's reading, John writes these words in verse 11. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. And then it says, and his disciples believed in him. Think about it. His disciples were there with him at that wedding. And this verse tells us that when his disciples witnessed this miracle, when they realized what had happened and what was going on, they believed in Jesus more deeply than they'd ever believed in him before. 
They realized that this guy that was sitting at the banquet table with them could take a simple, ordinary, commonplace thing, nothing special at all, water, and make it wine. But more than that, he could take a simple, ordinary, commonplace thing and turn it into a source of joy and life. You know, if you, uh, if you do a bit of a word study, uh, a little verse study throughout the Bible where it talks about wine, you'll often hear the Bible say that. Wine was more than just something they drank. It was a symbol throughout the Bible. You'll see it in the Psalms and other places. A symbol of God's life and joy in the world. But that day, Jesus' disciples sitting there with him realized that Jesus was the one that could offer new life. If Jesus could offer new life to water, imagine the new life that he could offer to all who believed in him. Well, this morning I want to um, kind of end our message a little bit differently. I want to end today and, and bring us into our time of Holy Communion by sharing a story. It's, it's really a, a telling of this story from a different viewpoint. It's based uh, or it's inspired by these words from John chapter 2. It's a story titled The Wedding Wine. She sits on a bench in front of the fire trying to warm her hands and feet for they are always cold now on chilly nights. He comes into the room and he pauses. He studies her face in the light of the fire, the shape of her forehead, the wrinkles in her face, the lips that he's kissed perhaps a thousand times or more. Honey, what if we finish off the rabbi's wine tonight? There's only one bottle remaining and, and it'll warm you up nice. Sure, she says, that sounds good. And so he goes and he gets the bottle of wine and, and he brings it back to the fire along with the only clean cup he can find. And as he uncorks the bottle, he says, I wonder if it will still be as good after all these years. It always has been, she said. The rabbi's wine has never gone bad. It's amazing. It's always been amazing as the day that he provided it. He pours the first serving and hands the cup to his wife. And she takes a sip and, and hands it back to him. And they look at each other and nod in agreement. The wine was just as flavorful as the day they were married. They sit together with that bottle of wine in that one cup and they, they drink very slowly. And, and as they are drinking, the memories start flooding back. Remember when Sarah was born, she says? You would have thought no one had ever been a father before the way you carried on running around the whole neighborhood. You guys drank a whole crate of wine that day. She says that you treated it like it was our wedding all over again. And he looks at her and smiles and says, well, you know, you did the same thing when Benjamin and Rebecca brought home our first grandchild. <laughs> she laughs. I guess I did, didn't I? Those were such good times. Good enough to never want them to stop. He pours a little wine, more wine into the cup and they each take a sip. And then he leans in to kind of stir the fire and he's just staring there at the flames as if almost in a trance and she's now watching his face and she notices that there are tears welling up in his eyes and she knows what he's thinking. He's remembering when their third child died. The little guy had been sick for days and they tried everything, but, but nothing seemed to work. He died. And the pain of that death was more than anything they'd ever known. They had prayed and prayed to God, but it, it seemed just as if God had abandoned them. And when they could not understand an answer from God, when they couldn't see God answering their prayers, they just began to take their hurt and their anger out on each other. 
One evening, he'd come home and she'd had supper ready. And they went about setting the table, never speaking a word to each other. They just went through the motions. As they sat down to eat, they realized that she had forgotten to draw water from the well and he had forgotten to bring home some wine from the market. And so she got up and found one of the bottles of wine from their wedding. She figured they might as well drink it that night because there was no sense in saving it for any more special occasions. Those were never coming again. And she poured some for each of them and when that wine, that wedding wine, touched their lips, they tasted more than grapes. They tasted grace in their hearts. And they broke down and sobbed and just held each other tightly. The grief of their loss never went away, but they discovered in that moment with that wine that life was still worth living, that a rich life was still possible. And now here they were before the fire these many years later, sitting, just gazing into each other's eyes, both recalling the hardships they had endured and, and how they had stayed together through it despite all of the things that tried to tear them apart. And they realized what a miracle. He holds the bottle upside down now over the cup. There's only a few last drops. And he hands the cup to her and says, here, you finish it. She takes just a tiny sip and, and hands it back to him and points out that there's, there's a, enough left for him. He puts the cup to his lips and he tilts his head back and he holds that cup straight up for a moment and just lets that last few drops drain. And then he slowly brings the cup back down and sets it on the table. Well, that's it, he says. There's no more wine. There's none left to pass along to our children or our grandchildren. There's all that we have now is just the story of our wedding in Cana and the rabbi who blessed us with that wine. But we have no more wine to give. And she looks at him and she says, not to worry. As long as people gather at his table, there will always be enough. Friends, I want you to know that the story of Jesus turning water into wine, yes, we could, we could find ourselves going down rabbit trail and rabbit trail and rabbit trail, but I want you to know this, that the story of Jesus' miracle turning water into wine is not about the message it's about the messenger. That day, we're told that Jesus revealed Himself. When Jesus turned water into wine, what He was doing was revealing God to those there that day that believed in Him. He was letting them know that, yes, He was Jesus the Messiah, but God was His Father. He was pointing them to God. The story for us, the message for us from the messenger is that Jesus can take the commonplace, can take the ordinary events of any life and with His presence make them fruitful. He can take the commonplace ordinary and with His presence create a flavor and a strength and a beauty that turns them into a life of joy. And friends, the good news is He didn't just do that once at Cana in Galilee. He does it today. The good news is that Jesus can do that with any of us, anyone. Anyone who faithfully walks with Him and follows Him and believes in Him. Jesus can take our ordinary life and give us a fruitful flavor, give us a new purpose that is alive and living and growing. Let's pray, shall we? Jesus, will you do that for us today? Will you take our ordinary lives and through your 
amazing power change us into something that is full of joy and beauty and strength. Jesus, will you, for us today, offer comfort to those who are feeling a bit challenged? And will you offer challenge to those of us who are feeling a bit comfortable with ourselves?